Hi, this is Chaplain Greg. Welcome back to the Wandering Wesleyan and our Walking in the Word series. If you are enjoying this content, please like and subscribe. Uh, love to see your comments. Write down some comments in the comments section and uh, share, share the video with other folks that may enjoy it. So we're going to continue our Walking in the Word series. In fact, we're getting really close to the end. Uh, we're going to be looking at the letters in the New Testament that were not written by Paul. And uh, then we're going to move next week to the writings of John. So uh, that would be his uh, first, second, and third John, as well as his uh, the, the book of Revelation. So that'll be uh, the next week. And then we were going to finish up the series with the Gospel of John. And I'll explain why we're finishing with the Gospel of John when we get there. But until then, we have a number of writers who aren't Paul and who aren't John that we need to uh, talk about. So that'd be James, Jude, and Peter, and then the letter to Hebrews. And we don't know who wrote Hebrews. Uh, but uh, And Hebrews reads more like a sermon than it does a letter. Um, but we'll, we'll get to that in a second. So let's start with James, or Yachab. Yachab is, uh, is James's Hebrew name. Uh, James is kind of an anglicized version of his Greek name. Um, but he is the half-brother of Jesus. Uh, he was an important leader in the church, as we read in Acts. And the letter is written to the entire church. So this is for everybody. So I'm going to read James 1.1. 1, 1. James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes dispersed abroad, greetings. So he's talking probably primarily to Jews, but this is for everybody. And um, the letter is written much like Proverbs. So Proverbs and, and even the uh, Sermon on the Mount. Proverbs and the Sermon on the Mount are two big influences to James for this letter. Uh, the book is not linear. So when you read Romans, or, um, or yeah, Romans is, is a great example of this, Paul sets up an argument and he works his way through different arguments, different things. James doesn't work like that. Much like Proverbs doesn't work like that, or the Sermon on the Mount really doesn't work like that. Um, it's not linear. He bounces from topic to topic, um, talking about specific things, uh, specifically around wisdom. Um, it was a disputed letter uh, because it doesn't present the gospel or really talk about Jesus all that much. However, you see Jesus throughout the book. You can, you can, as you're reading James, you can sense that this was something that he heard his brother talking about frequently during his ministry. Sometimes James is pitted against Paul because James talks a lot about how we express our faith in works. And if you remember from our discussion on, on the Apostle Paul, he took great pains to talk about how faith is completely different from works. So I'm going to read James 1, 22 through 25. I'm going to show you how this comes together, that they're complementary, that they're not contradicting each other. So starting at verse 22, be doers of the word and not hearers, only deceiving yourselves. Because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like someone looking at his own face in a mirror. For he looks at himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of person he was. But the one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and preserves it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of who works, this person will be blessed in what he does. Now I'm going to go now to chapter 2, and I'm going to read verses 14 through 26 where he's going to expand on this just a little bit more. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but does not have works? Can such a faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothes and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, 
Well, go in peace. Stay warm and be well fed. But you don't give them what the body needs. What good is it? In the same way, faith, if it does not have works, is dead by itself. Going on. But someone will say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without works, and I will show you a faith by my works. You believe that God is one. Great. Even the demons believe that. And they shudder. You senseless person. Are you willing to learn that faith without works is useless? Wasn't Abraham our father justified by works in offering Isaac his son at the altar? You see, faith was active together with his works, and by works, faith was made complete. And the scriptures was filled, fulfilled, that, it, that says, Abraham believed, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see, that a person is justified by his works and not by faith alone. In the same way, was it Rahab the prostitute also justified by works in receiving the message and sending them out by a different route? For just as the body is with body without the spirit is dead, so also is faith. Faith without works is dead. Powerful stuff, because faith and works are tightly put together. Works are evidence that we have faith. So, um, works do not save us, but they are an outpouring expression of the faith that we have put into Jesus Christ that demonstrates that faith. If we claim to be a follower of Jesus, but do not have an outpouring from ourselves of ministry to others, or have a care, or have compassion for those who are in need, then are we really followers of Jesus? Are we really following James's brother? That's what he's getting at. So the book of James. Let's go on to Jude. Uh, real quick book, real short. Uh, Jude was also half-brother of Jesus. His Hebrew name was Judah. Judah. Um, it was a letter written mainly to Messianic Jews. And it's a warning. And you're going to see this a lot in these letters. It's a warning against corrupt teachers. And he contends, Jude contends for the faith. So, the teacher's moral compass reveals their corrupt tech, uh, theology, okay? So, he's talking about how these teachers that he's addressing are morally compromised, that they are not following the morality uh, that uh, Jesus put forth. Um, they're not following the, mor the moral laws of Torah. Um, they are showing their corrupt theology by their immoral behavior. The moral compromise is a rejection of Jesus and the gospel. So he quotes a lot from the Hebrew scriptures and the extra writings of First Enoch and the Testament of Moses. Now we talked about this in our intertestamental period video about how there were a lot of these different uh, books written after Malachi and before the New Testament was being written. Well, First Enoch and the Testament of Moses are two. And they were very important books to the Jewish folks of that time. They weren't considered scripture, so we don't consider them scripture. But still, you know what? They're really important. We can get an awful lot out of it. Um, one of my favorite teachers, Dr. Michael Heiser, has a ton of videos on First Enoch. So do a search on uh, Dr. Michael Heiser and, uh, and Enoch, First Enoch, and, and you'll get a lot of really good information on that. Um, but that's essentially the book of Jude, uh, which brings us to Peter. Let's talk about Peter. So Peter has two letters. First Peter, probably written from Rome, 
who he calls throughout the letter Babylon. Isn't that interesting? Babylon throughout the scriptures is the symbol for the most evil, corrupt place. And so when, uh, when, when a biblical author calls something Babylon, and it doesn't appear to be the actual Babylon, well, that's, that's what they're trying to say. And that's what Peter's doing here. Uh, he calls Rome Babylon. And it, this letter is probably written towards the end of his life. It was a circular letter, meaning it wasn't written to one particular group, but it was meant to be distributed amongst all the churches. The letter focuses on giving hope to the persecuted church amid their suffering. So I want to read 1 Peter verses 3 through 9. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. Imagine being a persecuted Christian and, and reading those words. You are being guarded by God's power through faith for salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. You rejoice in this, even though now, for a short time, if necessary, you suffer grief and various trials so that the proven character of your faith, more valuable than gold through perish though perishable, is refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though not seeing him now, you believe, put your trust in him. Though not seeing him now, you believe in him, you rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Imagine, again, being a persecuted Christian and reading or hearing those words being spoken the encouragement that would offer you. So, he is bringing the Gentiles into the Hebrew story, which is being fulfilled in Jesus. Uh, this, is, this is an important theme throughout First Peter. Also, suffering, especially under persecution, brings authentic believers together as witnesses to the gospel. Suffering points to a future hope that we just read. Um, so that is Peter's first letter. Now his second letter is to the same audience. Okay, It's a dispersed letter. Peter is probably on the verge of martyrdom. And uh, we see that in uh, chapter 1. Um, chapter 1, verse 14. Since I know that I will soon lay aside my tent, as our Lord Jesus Christ has indeed made clear to me. So he thinks he's going to pass away. So he's, he's leaving these final messages for the church. Um, and being a follower of Jesus according to Peter, is a lifelong pursuit marked by these seven things. Goodness, knowledge, self-control, godliness, endurance, family affection, most of all, love. These seven items are really what distinguish, distinguishes a follower of Jesus. Combine this with James's message of an outpouring of works. Goodness, knowledge, self-control, godliness, endurance, family affection, and love that is outpoured in how we treat other people and the things we do. Like Jude, he also warns about corrupt leaders that are trying to corrupt the church. In chapter 2 the, through uh, chapter 3, verse 9, he talks about these people. And 
he talks about people, teachers being corrupted by money and sex. Again, that goes back to Jude's, Jude's thing that, you know, you see immoral teachers have corrupt theology. So they're corrupted by money and sex. Freedom in Christ also means that they got to sin the way they wanted to. This is what they were teaching. So they were corrupt in their morals, and they were teaching that it was okay for them to be corrupt in their morals because they have freedom in Christ, which is exactly not what that means. It's a distorted teaching from Romans. Um, and Paul, Peter then quotes First Enoch. And again, so he's using those, those extra testamental books as well. Really, the final hope is in the new creation. And let me read 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 18. Here he says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, the elements will burn and be dissolved, and the earth and the works on it shall be disclosed. Since all these things are to be dissolved in this way, it is clear what sort of people you should be in holy conduct, conduct and godliness. As you wait for the day of God and hasten its coming, because of that day the heavens will be dissolved with fire and the elements will melt with heat. But based on his promise, we wait for new heavens and new earth where righteousness dwells. This is from a man who's about to be martyred. Isn't that beautiful? The new heavens and the new earth. So much of our Christian, Western Christian message is accept Jesus so that when you die, you get to go to heaven. That is not what Peter is preaching here. Peter, Peter is preaching, endure, go through it. You become a follower of Jesus so that you can display goodness, knowledge, self-control, godliness, endurance, family affection, and love. And we do this because we await the new heaven and the new earth, the new creation. That's our final hope. It's not to be disembodied spirits in some far-off ether world with God. It's to be members of the kingdom of God in the new heavens and the new earth and the new creation. And this brings us to Hebrews. Hebrews, and I'm going to go a little long with this one because I want to get all of this in. Hebrews, the author's unknown. And the author had a first-hand relationship with the apostles and had a deep knowledge of Torah. The audience is probably Messianic Jews who knew the Torah and could understand all of the references that the writer of Hebrews makes. Hebrews reads more like a sermon than a letter. So it could have been a sermon that was passed around to different churches that was given by one of the apostles to the churches. The audience is also under persecution for their faith. And some were walking away from their faith. Chapter 10, verses 32 and 34 demonstrate that. Jesus is compared to four key uh, Torah references to show Jesus' superiority and to encourage believers to stay strong during this persecution. So chapters 1 through 2, angels and the Torah. Angels delivered the Torah to Moses. Jesus is superior to all of those prior messages because he was the message. He didn't need angels to deliver it to us. It's a warning. Don't neglect Jesus' teachings and ministry. Chapters 3 through 4. Uh, Jesus is superior to Moses. So Moses led Israel out of Egypt and built the tabernacle. Jesus is superior um, because he built the whole of creation. He made everything. And he led humanity out of the exile of sin. He did everything the Torah couldn't do. And this is the warning. 
Jesus is the greater than Moses, so rejecting him is far more disastrous than rejecting the Torah. All right, next one. The priests and Melchizedek. So the priests, who were Levites, descended from a single person, Aaron, and were supposed to be God's intermediaries through sacrifices, and that became corrupt. Almost immediately, we read that. If you remember back to our discussion of, uh, of judges, even, you know, judges and uh, all, all the way through Samuel and Kings, you know, the whole priestly system was just corrupt. They couldn't keep their act together. Okay? So, Jesus is the ultimate priest like Melchizedek. So, if you remember Melchizedek from Genesis 14, he was the priest king of Salem who Abraham made an offering to. He's also mentioned in Psalm 110, verses 1 through 4, and that is a messianic psalm. Melchizedek lived before all of the tribes, but yet he was a priest. He lived before the law and before sacrifices, yet he was a priest. He was a priest king. Jesus is the priest king. He is our intermediary. We go to Jesus for salvation and relationship with God, and Jesus is king. The whole Gospel of Mark talks about how Jesus is king. Chapters 8 through 10 then talk a lot about sacrifice and covenant. Sacrifices through the Torah had to be offered consistently. Uh, Jesus' sacrifice was once for all humanity and is permanent. Walking away from the offer of forgiveness, and this is our warning, is dying without acceptance of it, and that is permanent. We finish Hebrews with chapters 11 through 13. This follows Jesus I'm sorry, follow, we follow Jesus by following the models of faith throughout the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11 is often called the Faith Hall of Fame of all the Old Testament folks who followed God through faith. And that's what this sermon to the Hebrews is all about. So next week, um, we're going to start looking at John, we'll begin by talking about what happened to everybody. Before we get into John, we'll talk about what happened to everybody. All the disciples, uh, some of the characters surrounding Jesus, what happened to them after the New Testament was written? That should be interesting. But until then, if you like this video, please like and subscribe. Um, leave a comment, share. And until next week, God bless.